Okay, good morning, and uh, in the interest of time, uh, let's start on time. Um, I'm happy that we can be all here uh, today in person. Uh, in the spring, Peter Evans sent, uh, sent a message to Patrick and I uh, saying, oh, you know, uh, Michael Burabo is going to be in Cambridge and you should organize something. And uh, I went to Patrick and I said, I have this idea. We need a conversation about the colonization in the discipline. And Patrick said, OK, let's do it. And here we are. Um, for a second, it looked like, you know, Delta was going to throw a wrench on our plans, but fortunately, we can be here in person. As you can see, I'm masked. We are all masked. And the policy of the university is that uh, we need to keep the mask on even we are speaking. It's not like in class that we, have, need to, we can choose to take it out. And we were talking last night about that. Um, you know, whether it's annoying or uncomfortable, and I understand that there are many positions on that. Personally, for me, and this is very personal, I, as a person who works at Brown, I like to come to work in a place in which, you know, I feel that I don't take unnecessary risk and I don't put other people at risk, even if I have to wear the mask. So it creates a sense of mutual caring and community that I appreciate. So uh, we are going to be here with the mask, and I hope that still we can project our voices and get the content uh, across. And we are recording this event, so I hope that the recording is clear, even though we are be talking with masks. And uh, so th there is a call in the disciplines these days for decolonizing the sociology, decolonizing the social sciences, but I don't think it's very clear what we mean by that, uh, or what every person calling for decolonizing the disciplines mean by that. And I think that it is necessary to have a series of dialogues between uh, people thinking on these terms to try to come to some kind of understanding and some kind of program about what the colonizing the discipline means. And this is the purpose of this day. We have three panels. In the first, uh, we, we will soon we will be discussing uh, an, an, an article that Michael Buraboy wrote. And, uh, Michael Burbo is now to all of us, or most of us, in, and it was for many of us an inspiration to go into sociology, so it's a great pleasure to have him here. And uh, in the panel, there are uh, three former Berkeley students that were, <laughs> in some way or another, touched by the work of Michael, and they were all very happy to be here and comment and have an engagement with him. So that talks about, uh, you know, the, what he was as a mentor, as a teacher. And uh, so uh, Frieden Blumor and uh, Jordana Matron will be commenting. And I hope, uh, you know, although we all like Michael, we will have some lively debate. And um, that will be the first panel. In the second panel, the, the task of the second panel is to think in broader terms, you know, what does it mean to decolonize the disciplines, what is entailed in that, both in terms of theories and methodologies. And we have uh, two young scholars who have been at the forefront of thinking on these terms, uh, Katrina Kisumbin King and Sophia Edwards, and also our own Paget Henry, who has been in these trenches for longer than any of us and uh, whose book, uh, Caliban's Reason, is one of the best books I have re read. If you haven't, I, I strongly recommend. And the last panel, uh, it will be an open dialogue with all the participants. Organizer privilege, I will summarize and put some questions for the, the participants, and then we'll take questions from the audience and participation from the audience. It's a panel that aims to kind of bring together all the conversation and see where do we need to go or what we need to do to move on decolonizing the discipline. 
So that's the plan for the day. As I say, we are recording. There are some people I need to thank that without them, uh, this event would not have been possible. Uh, first, GPD and Nitsan, when I went and told her about the event, and I told her, you know, I don't know how to fund this without me asking or saying anything, she said, oh, GPD can find this. So without Nitsan, we wouldn't be here. So thanks, Nitsan. Um, and I have to thank also the Department of Sociology. I asked for support from, by the, from the department, and the department, uh, without asking, immediately gave me the support. So thanks to GPD, thanks to Nitsan, and thanks to the department. This event also would not be possible without the work uh, of uh, the staff. And uh, Ellen White here at Watson really did uh, marvelous work in helping coordinate and getting hotel reservations and getting the tickets and all that. So, I mean, thank you very much, Ellen. I mean, this would not be possible without Ellen's uh, help. And also, you know, we have to remember the maintenance, cleaning, and janitorial work that we take for granted, I don't know, but without whose work, we couldn't enjoy these, these spaces. And also, I got some uh, compliments for the beautiful flyer, and I think it's beautiful, and credit for that goes to Georgina Manok, who uh, very, very, very graciously volunteered to design it. So thanks, Georgina. And uh, we can, uh, you know, do an event on decolonizing the discipline without uh, mentioning and without acknowledging that we are at Brown in Providence on Narragansett lands. And uh, without uh, acknowledging that this region was the cradle of settler colonialism in North America. And as uh, Evelyn Nakano Glenn taught us, settler colonialism is not something on the past, it's an ongoing structure. We are talking about, the, when we say we are sitting in Narragansett class, we are not talking about the past, we are talking about the present. And we are also sitting in New England, uh, whose economy grew uh, thanks to its involvement in the trading enslaved people. A trade that was also instrumental in creating the university in which we you know, uh, work or study. So we are sitting in one of these uh, places um, that is at the center of the processes of dispossession, displacement, and enslavement that created the modern world and that still shaped the modern world. By putting forward the proposition that perhaps one of the things about uh, displacing, about decolonizing sociology uh, is uh, taking this, process, this global historical processes of uh, displacement, enslavement, dispossession, and put them at the center of our theoretical reflections, putting at the center of our th theories, and putting at the center, and thinking also how to put them at the center of our methods. So taking this, uh, you know, we, we, we are sitting here in Providence, Rhode Island at Brown University at the cradle of settler colonialism and of the trading enslavement people and start to think from there and build our sociology from acknowledging those processes that shape the, the world in which we live. Uh, so with that, and I don't know why the light, I just <laughs> said that and the light goes off. <laughs> the room opposes. <laughs> uh, okay, so with that, I want to leave the floor to Patrick, who will be moderating the first panel. Thank you, Jose. So my name is Patrick Heller. I'm a professor here in the Department of Sociology and also at the Watson Institute. And I can't tell you how extraordinary this is to be looking out at a room of packed half faces. Um, <laughs> it's extraordinary. And it's been so long. So thank you for being here to colleagues, friends, graduate students. Um, and let me just say that, you know, this is a big debate in sociology, in the department, in the discipline, and we're going to carry on the debate today. I, I also want to underscore that it's been a debate at the Watson Institute. And all of last year, beginning just before COVID, but through COVID, the undergrad students at Brown have driven a conversation about decolonizing the curriculum. And it's been a very powerful 
very informative and I think very productive conversation. And so it's, it's great to see uh, some of the, our undergraduate students here today. So it is my uh, pleasure to be able to introduce uh, Michael Borovoy. Um, many of you are familiar with his work. He's a, uh, an ethnographer of labor. His work has taken him from the factory floors of the United States to the mines of Zambia and uh, through South Africa and Eastern Europe. Uh, many of you will be familiar with um, some of his books, Manufacturing Consent, Politics of Production. The last time you were here was a long time ago, but it was part of the conversation that, that Michael started about public sociology. I know many of you have been engaged with that, and of course, decolonizing sociology is also about making sociology more engaged with broader publics. Michael's also been engaging with sociological theory through the works of Gramsci, Polanyi, Bourdieu, and most recently through the works of Du Bois, although he's been working with Du Bois for quite some time. And today, indeed, this conversation is organized around uh, the article that Jose mentioned, which appeared recently in Critical Sociology, Decolonizing Sociology, the Significance of W.E. Du Bois. Our first commentator, will be Jordana Matlin, who's from American University. Jordana is an urban ethnographer who studies racial capitalism and the articulation of black masculinity in Africa and the diaspora. Her work focuses on the ways back blackness operates as a signifier and intersects with gender norms. And um, the great, wonderful news is that on May 15th, we will all be able to get a hold of her book, A Man Among Other Things, The Crisis of Black Masculinity and Racial Capitalism that is forthcoming from Cornell University Press. Our second commentator will be Frieda Blumor, who's an associate professor of sociology and education at Tufts University. Um, Frieda um, is the past chair of the Boston Consortium for the Graduate Studies in Gender, Culture, Women, and Sexuality. His research connects the debates on gender and masculinity in education with African-American intellectual and political history. And recently, he has written extensively about how feminist and humanist insights can inform and enrich a Dubosian sociology. So I think we have a wonderful panel today. And with no further ado, Michael, 15 minutes, and then over to Jordana and Frieden. And oh, what's this for? PowerPoint. PowerPoint? You, you, you have, have a PowerPoint? Yeah. <laughs> you don't have a cell phone I'm and getting, you have a PowerPoint? I'm getting old. What am I supposed to do with it? Is there something to do with this thing? <laughs> Your story. <laughs> How many PhDs does it take to? <laughs> Don't take this out of my 15 minutes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you. No I always said, like, when I gave job talks like that, I didn't actually say anything. Can you put one of these in too? Can you put this in? Um, no. Yeah. Sometimes I weird people out. Um, Worry about content. Let's not worry about. Yeah, it's one less thing to worry about. Which one is it? This one here? The cannon? The cannon. Oh, that's great. So I won't forget it. Just make sure it works. How's this look? Yeah. Yeah. Good. Good. It's just these, right? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Let's try that out first. Yep. Okay. All right. Yeah. I'll sit down to begin with. Okay. Mm. So, um, it's a total pleasure and delight to be here. So, thanks, Jose, for organizing this um, and, uh, and all your can I a little louder? Speak in the microphone or something? Okay, okay. I'll do my best. Okay, yeah, can you hear me, Louise? Okay, all right. Um, so, I was just thanking Jose for organizing this wonderful event. Um, yeah, I'm in the Boston area, and um, it's, it's vibrating. Uh, there's actually, I don't know if you know, there's a Du Bois Orchestra 
And um, it's a fascinating story because it's relevant to what I'm going to be saying. They play classical music and then they choose a composer from a minority background and one for and there's some attempt I'm no musician but there's some attempt to have a conversation between the two so it's a it's, a, it's very much uh, in line with what I'm going to say to date um, it's really really exciting to be here as Patrick said and Jose said well it's just to do something in person is quite extraordinary and um, this is the second time I've done anything in person in the last, whatever it is, two and a half years. Um, so I am really happy to be here. And that's the second reason um, to be at Brown, which I figure is the epicenter of the new sociology. Um, <laughs> and uh, you have amazing faculty here now who are, and graduate students too, and um, undergraduates always. So I'm really excited to have this conversation here. What better place? I think it's also a, I'm excited because this is a special moment in sociology. Um, it reminds me of the time when I was young and when Marxism appeared in sociology. And this is, and then I remember teaching, actually Patrick taught with me a few years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, just a few. Um, and it, it was... Uh, it was a st I always used to teach this two-semester theory course, and it was a conversation between Marxism and sociology. And that is rather stagnated, I think, and I think we're in a new moment now, um, a new moment, a race moment, an anti-colonial moment, an empire moment, whatever you want to call it. And it's great that we're having this discussion on decolonizing sociology. Um, the other, another reason why it's exciting for me to be here, because I have two commentators whom I didn't actually work with, well, somewhat, but basically did not work with them, who are people of a new generation who are actually teaching, teaching me um, the new dimensions of sociology. So from Frieden has been feeding me all sorts of interesting Du Bois literature and writing wonderful articles himself. And Jordana introduced me to this idea of racial capitalism, um, which I suspect we will be discussing sometime today. Um, so it's great, and that's one of the virtues of being old, is that one can actually uh, learn from one's students. And I've been doing it probably for 30, 40 years. Um, perhaps for the first 10 years I was supposedly leading, but now I I've always been following. And Du Bois is an inspiration to this. Because Du Bois never stopped changing his mind and learning. Uh, you know, it's interesting that, you know, he comes across m Marx in, what, 19, it's hard to tell, but 1928, 29, when he's 60 years old. He, come, he writes World in Africa when he's 80 years old. And he continues for another 15 years. He's always continued learning. And it's fascinating. I was reading Gerald Horne's book on Du Bois, Red and Black, and how Du Bois was actually always engaged with younger people, not something that is sort of noticed perhaps in the literature, but that was always an inspiration for him too. All right, that's my introduction. How many minutes have I got, Patrick? About 10. <laughs> All right. I got a six-point plan for decolonizing sociology. I want to stand up. Perhaps it will go more quickly. Yeah. Okay. Do you need room? <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm going to take my mask off. I am not a member of... The, but are there objections to me doing that? Going, going. <laughs> Do, no? Yeah. No? All right, gone. All right. So, ten minutes. Oh, let me have a, my watch then. Okay. So this is the plan. Let me just summarize the plan. It's the six points are... First, um, let me just first of all say this is a six-point plan for decolonization, but not for decanonization. So please don't walk out of the room. Um, <laughs> right. These are the six points. Criteria for the canon, theory of the canon, orientation towards the canon, canonical dialogues, Du Bois's challenge to the canon, and the canon's challenge to Du Bois. So here we go. Criteria for the canon. We have this Marx Weber Durkheim triumvirate. What do they share? Theory of the canon. What does it mean to have a canon? 
and third, orientation. What do we do with the canon? Theory. Now, what do, what do Marx, Weber, and Durkheim have in common? My claim is they have a theory of history. I spent many years arguing with graduate students in Berkeley that Bourdieu did not belong in the canon because he does not have a theory of history. I think Marx, Weber, and Durkheim, however problematic, have a theory of history. They're a moral science. Each of them has, is committed to a set of values that underpin, that underpin their theorization. They have a conception of society, more or less clear, a theory of the reproduction of society and of its transformation. And they also have a distinct, each of them a distinct methodology, and they've actually put that methodology into practice with exemplary research. I should say the moral science component is very important because it conveys the idea of a utopian visions, which is also sometimes implicit in a theory of history. All right, we can argue about that, but those are the criteria, as far as I'm concerned, of, that Marx, Weber, and Durkheim share. Theory of the canon. Well, these characters, Marx, Weber, and Durkheim, I believe are the foundations of the discipline of sociology at this point in time, um, though changing, as we, I will see, as I will say. They are foundational in the sense there are research programs um, that are associated with Marx, Weber, and Durkheim. There are people who claim that Marx, Weber, and Durkheim are completely irrelevant. And I'll say a little bit about that in a minute. Um, I think they are fundamental. Um, and without them, we are lost. Well, I'm glad you're laughing. Okay, <laughs> second point. The second point is that the canon is relational. It is not just a matter of adding people. The canon is a set of relations, in this case, among Marx, Weber, and Durkheim. It has to be seen. If we bring Du Bois in, we have to think about relations of Du Bois to Marx, Weber, and Durkheim might be the end of Marx, Weber, and Durkheim, but it is relational. It's not a matter of just adding people. And third, the, the canon is dynamic. It has a history. It changes over time. Sociology is not what it was 50 years ago. So foundational, relational, historical. To put some flesh on the historical, Parsons invented, together with, we might say, C. Wright Mills, so we have the sort of more conservative and the more radical sociologists of the 50s. So together conceived of a canon, the Marx Weber Durkheim canon, though Mills didn't have much to do with Durkheim. Um, Parsons started with Marshall, Pareto, Weber, and Durkheim. That's 1937. Drops Marshall and Pareto because I think in the end that was a concession to the economists and basically argued that, well, we don't need to make any concessions to the economists anymore. We are the queen of the social sciences. So Durkheim and Weber uh, remain. And then 50s moves on to 60s, all sorts of struggles, all sorts of internal contradictions. And one of the big mistakes Parsons made, he had a convergent idea of the relational characteristic of the canon a convergent one. And I believe that the success of the intervention of Marx that comes in the 70s, um, the success of that was it didn't converge, that's, the canon did not converge on a singular framework, but became a debate among these canonical figures. So I believe today that we are having in a situation where we have to again enter W.B. Du Bois and with him the canon gets reconfigured. Yeah. It is dynamic, relational, and foundational. What's going on here? That's OK. Next, what are our, our orientation to the canon? Well, there are people like me. No, no, let's leave me out of it. There are people who I call conservationists who really stick with the canon. And they're probably the majority of our discipline. Our discipline is. It's very backward. I mean, this debate that we're having in, in sociology has been happening in other disciplines long ago. Anthropology, Louise is here. She knows this debate has been going. And they just got rid of their canon, as far as I can tell. But their canon was really embarrassing. Yeah, very embarrassing. So they had the advantage of embarrassment. Anyway, perhaps we do too. Conservationists, holding on to the canon as it stands. Most people do this because, you know, if you've been teaching as long as I have, then you have to switch. 
That's a lot of work. I've invested a lot in these characters. But I think there are genuine criteria for these canonical figures. Then there are the retreatists, basically the people, I'm going to introduce, I talk about positivists and post-colonialists. The positivists say, I've always said, why the hell are we worrying about Marx, Weber, and Durkheim? You know, 19th century, they're completely antediluvian. They do not actually speak to the latest methods that we use in sociology, et cetera, et cetera. And, and, and indeed, they're the ones who quote Alfred North Whitehead, a discipline that hesitates to forget its founders discipline that hesitates to forget its founders is lost. Uh, those are, so then there are post-colonialists. And they, of course, have generated fascinating, important, and there may be quite a few here today, um, uh, a fascinating discussion. Um, and basically also say the limitations of Marx, Weber, and Durkheim by virtue of them being what these white guys in 19th century Europe have a limited perspective on the world. That's limited, I suppose, is a generous way of putting it. Um, and both positivists and post-colonialists want to retreat. I, when, you, when I read post-colonial theory, whether it's Julian Goh or Zina Magabani or Gurmin de, uh, de Bambra, they, it's, it's not a rejection. They don't worry about the canon. The canon sort of fritters away. And it, it, perhaps they, the canonical cares can be... It's a, there's an eclecticism, a, a multiple perspectival approach. I, and Julian calls it a perspectival realism. So it's almost like anything goes. It is a way of retreating from the canon. Then there are the revolutionaries. Now, I don't know if Jose and Carida are revolutionaries, uh, but they seem to be saying, well, there's a Du Bois in sociology and don't have much to say about Marx, Weber, and Durkheim in their book. And so perhaps this is the revolution, a Du Bois in sociology. Um, yeah. And then there are the reconstructionists. This is where I sit. I'm in the business of reconstructing the canon, bringing Du Bois in and seeing what that implies vis-a-vis -vis the conversation. So let me move on to this fourth of the six-part story. Why well, won't it work? There we go. Canonical dialogues. That's where we were before. And what is interesting, when Marx enters, we had a whole different reading of Dur Durkheim suddenly became a socialist. A socialist. Re 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 and nobody was reading book three of Division of Labor. Patrick, did you read book three? <laughs> really? Mm. Book three of Division of Labor. You know, it's, it's a vision of guild socialism there. Labor became more focused on domination rather than the theory of social action. So it, Marx really made a huge difference, and the reading of Marx also was a novel one when brought into this canon. So then we have Du Bois. Now, the, the, the meat of the paper I wrote I, is really these canonical dialogues of which I have no time to talk through, but basically what I'm suggesting is that there are the Durkheimian Du Bois, a really deeply problematic Du Bois of the Philadelphia Negro, and to a lesser extent, but still problematic, souls of black folk, when he is speaking to whites, trying to convince whites that African Americans have contributions to make, are human beings. Um, there's a debate with Weber, which I call the anti it's the anti-Weber debate, and associated with John Brown, the wonderful book. Well, Du Bois thought it was his best book. I don't think it's his best book. But anyway, it's basically it's the idea of the insurgency behind history that was not in the earlier Du Bois, and of course, Dark Water, which I think is a magnificent set of essays. Um, but it's the anti Weber. It's, it's the recognition of the centrality already of imperialism, the centrality of race, the centrality of the interaction between race and class. I can't go into it, and if I start, I won't stop. So let me just leave it at that. And then finally, there is the, the Marxian Du Bois, and Black Reconstruction is his magnum opus. And then there is the world of Africa. They are somewhat different. Uh, and I think if I were to reconstruct this reconstruction, I'd have to sort of separate those two. I think there is to be had of many debates with the black radical tradition, particularly Fanon. But anyway, that... Um, is what, that's, the, that's the new sets of dialogues, and that's how I will, um, uh, how I set it up. Sort of the negative, then the anti-Weber, the sort of the, first the, the, the 
Durkheimian, then the anti-Weber, and then the Marxian uh, dialogue. So, all right, so my last two slides are basically, so, okay, suppose we do this, suppose we have these discussions, what happens? Well, my conclusion is this. Canon faces Du Bois. What happens to the canon? Well, we have to center racial capitalism, and we can discuss what racial capitalism is, but, it, but minimally, we're talking about a global, historical perspective of capitalism through, through, seen through the lens of race. For me, racial capitalism is a methodological approach. It's basically seeing capitalism through the lens of race, and there are different ways of actually conceiving of racial capitalism in this way. Um, and, of course, it will involve, if we're having, if a Du Bois is really uh, a central figure, we have to understand this through the succession of colonialism and imperialism. It's a reflective science. One of the great things about Du Bois is that he situates himself in the world he is studying. And so it's, it's an experiential moment. It's central to Du Bois, and, but it, he's continually reflecting, continually reflecting on his past. And Frieden actually wrote an interesting article recently that he showed me. I'm talking about the uh, Du Bois' aftershadowing. He was always engaged in a reconsideration of what he had been saying and his own life. Yeah. The dusk of dawn. The end as beginning. The end as beginning. Always re-beginning. It's perhaps an optimistic moment in Du Bois. Then, that's, uh, then the, can, the uh, a canonical... Uh, member has to have a moral science and based in foundational values and with it there are visions of utopia I'm very influenced by the work of Eric Olin Wright a very good friend of mine and his ideas of real utopia so it means that sociology has to be founded in moral values which I of course claim Marx, Weber and Durkheim um, are, are themselves exemplars it's an interdisciplinary science that recognizes disciplines only to transcend them. I mean, the genres of Du Bois are extraordinary. And it would really transform the character of sociology. And it has to be a public science. One of the ironies is, you know, Alda Morris um, uh, says, you know, the scholar denied. And indeed, the scholar was denied. Du Bois was denied. He was subject to racism and exclusion and inaccessible funds and so on and so forth. But his exclusion led him out and led him to be the scholar emancipated, the scholar liberated. He did the work that he did because he was, in a sense, forced out of academia. He became the public sociologist par excellence. There is no sociologist in the world of the equivalent of, in my view, of Du Bois. All of which I can't substantiate today. Um, <laughs> and last, all right, why on earth should those Du Boisians be in the slightest bit concerned with what with this, dial, this canonical dialogue? What does it bring to Du Bois? Well, I think it does bring things to Du Bois. First of all, it sociologizes Du Bois. Every discipline has its own Du Bois. I was listening to Tommy Shelby the other day. Who's, this, who's a um, African-American philosopher at Harvard. And he was having a wonderful critique, which you should read, of, of Cedric Robinson. And he ended up by saying, Du Bois is an analytical Marxist. Now, Du Bois is anything but an analytical Marxist. But since philosophy is analytical, they make Du Bois into an analytical Marxist. See? <laughs> yeah. So everybody, every discipline, and indeed, within our disciplines, everybody has their favorite Du Bois. And of course, the point I'm trying to make and is that, indeed, this is my third point here, um, that Du Bois, you can't just take bits of Du Bois. To understand Du Bois, we've got to take the whole lot. And that is really difficult. But taking the whole lot um, is facilitated by bringing Du Bois into dialogue with these other three characters. And systematizing Du Bois, perhaps the whole point is not to systematize, but in my view it is to systematize, to take black reconstruction and to actually deal with the 
the, the, the chunk in the middle where he compares the different racial class configurations in different states and sees how democracy does or does not develop in those. That requires a careful comparative analysis that probably only well, historians like Eric Foner can do. But we, we, we need, I think, to, to be able to read, for example, essays like even Souls of White Folk or of Wealth and, 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 and Work or, the, in, or the, 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 the Damnation of Women. Take those and bring them up to a, more, a, a greater level of generality so that we can begin to argue what would he be saying today? Yes, to take his historical specificity and move upwards to a more general claim. And finally, yeah, I think these dialogues would force a critique of Du Bois. Um, there is a tendency to engage in what Adolf Reed um, calls vindicationalism. Yes, African Americans too gave up, produced brilliant works. And there's a celebration of Du Bois. We have to be careful about that celebration. There are really, prob what we would regard if written by others, really problematic. Take the Philadelphia Negro that Alden takes as the founding of American sociology. Whoa! Um, together with the Atlanta School. You know, yes, he did found in, this, in, the, in the sense that Alden uses the word, found American sociology. And that is why American sociology is so, in a sense, deeply problematic. Because the Philadelphia Negro is a deeply problematic, deeply problematic text and has all the problems that we know of Durkheim. So yes, so I'm, there's four things. I think bringing Du Bois into dialogue will lead us to a critique of Du Bois, moving beyond Du Bois, developing a Du Boisian sociology and Du Boisian research program. So on that note, I will finish. I probably went over. I'm sorry. Thank you, Michael. Uh, Jordana this is going to be our first commentator. Of course, I spill water in my mouth just as I... <laughs> <laughs> Um, thank you so much, Jose, for this invitation. It's such a pleasure to be here, and I'm a little bit insulted that Michael... Oh. What? Use the microphone. Okay, sorry. I'm a little bit insulted that Michael said I was not his student, because while I was, he was not on my PhD, can you hear me? Um, he was the chair of my qualifying exams and the chair of my master's, and I took a class with you every semester for my first two years, so... <laughs> But you deviated so I much. I did, I did, but then I came back with Gramsci, so. <laughs> um, and, and of course, you know, one of the situations you have when somebody does a presentation and you've read the article is your remarks are always based on the article unless you're very good at speaking, you know, extemporaneously, which I'm not. And um, so I have to qualify that. Um, but I do quote uh, uh, Michael, um, and so I am referring directly to passages, so hopefully you'll be able to follow along pretty well. And I will also couch it with just when, when you know, he, he set out in one of the first slides the, sh the shared criteria for the canon, that my analysis is much more focused on the theory of history and the conception of society. So that's where I'm going when I think about canonization. So... I believe I was alongside my brilliant friend, Tiana Pachel, and under Professor Rocca Ray, the first graduate student in Berkeley's sociology theory qualifying exams to have an emphasis on post-colonial theory. Michael Borovoy was my falls chair, and Peter Evans was also on my committee, so I have half of my committee here in this room, braining back the nightmares. <laughs> The immediate question, given the non-traditional selection, was why post-colonial theory at all? How did it contribute to and what did it offer sociological theory? These questions and my answer reflect the agenda set forth by Du Boisian sociology and are worth revisiting as we discuss Michael Borovoy's paper, Decolonizing Sociology, the Significance of W.E.B. Du Bois here today. Borovoy begins by considering what sociology has to say of the crises of this contemporary moment and asks, now, why might Marx, Weber, and Durkheim be relevant to the problems of today? There are many answers to this question, he says, 
but the most obvious one is that we are indeed returning to the desperate times of the 19th century, the period in which sociology struggled to be born. We are returning, he writes, to the raw capitalism, those deep economic and political crises that constituted the object of Marx, Weber, and Durkheim's critical analysis. These figures of the canon, to paraphrase Borovoy then, gave us the origin stories, grand theories to account for our as present lived world order of capitalist modernity. Yet, as I responded to my professors in that room in Barrows Hall many years ago, these origin stories were, to put it gently, fundamentally incomplete. To be blunt, they were fatally flawed. They ignored the majority of the world's populations and the necessary parts these populations and their conquered territories played in originating capitalist modernity. Those other populations became rather representations of the pre-modern or precursors to the capitalist, relegated to the exteriors of history making, at best objects rather than the acting subjects of history. In bringing the world back into grand theory, post-colonial theory, like Du Boisian sociology, is a corrective that displaces the neatly contained story of evolutionary transformation for one of relational gain and dispossession, not as a temporary phase of, say, primitive accumulation, but as a permanent condition. As Lisa Lowe writes in The Intimacies of Four Continents, unquote, the understanding of the past and present is structured by existing conventions for knowing and representing modernity through narratives of progress and development. It is a colonial imperative that has compelled normative forms of modern subject, society, and state in the colonized world, an imperative that continues to organize post-colonial Africa, Asia, and the Americas in relation to the telos of modern European form. The origin stories that the canon tells are in short about past and present, yes, but they also produce a normative understanding that con constrains our visions, our sociological imaginations of and for the future. These origin stories then entail an understanding not only of disciplinary coherence, i.e. what constitutes the boundaries of sociology, but of the correspondence between sociological theory and the empirical world. For Du Bois, as Itzigzon and Brown explain in the sociology of W.E.B. Du Bois, life experience, research, and activism led him to theorize what they call racialized modernity, a sociological approach that recognized racism and colonialism as, unquote, the pillars upon which the modern world was constructed, and thus necessarily at the center of sociological analysis. The color line, they explain, is what marks modernity as a singular epoch in the annals of history and constitutes a social relation rooted in place and time, a mechanism of exclusionary power, and a base for social action. As an origin story, racialized modernity theorizes in short agency and structure, identity, and action. Therefore, rather than canonizing him, uh, unquote, alongside the existing founding fathers of the discipline, Itzigzon and Brown call for an alternative epistemological genealogy of the modern world altogether, one that recovers, unquote, a lineage of thinkers that come from its peripheries and exclusions. Regarding the significance of Du Bois for sociology, Bervoy concurs with Itzigzon and Brown and outlines five challenges that Du Bois raises to the conventional sociological canon, a global and historical perspective on capitalism that pays attention to the centrality of race, the pursuit of a moral, reflexive, and interdisciplinary science, and a necessary public engagement, as we've seen. Incorporating Du Bois into the canon, Bervoy writes, changes the criteria defining the canon, compelling rereadings of that canon. Yet here he departs from Isigzon and Brown and suggests that a Du Boisian sociology would entail a consensual canon convergent on a singular framework. He proposes instead a relational or contested canon in which each member stakes out a distinctive research program, a dynamic unity based on opposing perspectives. Out of the conversations, he concludes, there tentatively emerge new criteria that become foundational to our discipline. This is a critical departure for the significance of the Du Boisian sociological agenda 
and in fact challenges its premise to such an extent that I suppose it is what brings us here today and also your proximity being in Boston. <laughs> this departure suggests rather than a corrective to our disciplinary foundations an equivalency that each of the founders offer in their own right a crucial lens through which to see the modern world. To respond, I will apply a Du Boisian critique to some of Borovoy's arguments in defense of the sociological canon and close by returning to a Du Boisian analysis of those crises that Borovoy described at the start of his essay. Asking why not delete Marx, Weber, and Durkheim and let Du Bois stand alone, Borovoy gives the example of the domination of the Parsonian structural functionalism in the 1950s, which he contends proved to be its own undoing. Now, there's much to be said about Parsons, not the least that he was an apologist for the status quo, whose ideas simply did not stand up against empirical evidence. I would certainly like to believe that that was the cause of his undoing rather than his generation of singular dominance. But the example of Parsons is also useful for the relationship between science and politics that Du Bois insisted was ever present. Borovoy contends that Marx, Weber, and Durkheim, unquote, were founders and had to struggle for, their, for the very existence of sociology against other disciplines. But this is not, I ask, but is this not, I ask, an anachronistic reading of disciplinary coherence that attributes these figures' intellectual projects to a tradition that only came to be identified as sociology later. And in fact, Borovoy observes that Marx's canonization only occurred in the 1970s. And here he spoke about the 1950s with, with uh, Mills and Parsons uh, for, for Weber and Durkheim. The discipline of sociology is not a priori. Rather, it is a construction by fallible human actors who had personal stakes in its shaping. Ideas bad or not coagulate it to form what we now call the canon. So while Borovoy asserts that Marx, Weber, and Durkheim are a product of their times, he insists that we also ask what it made it possible for them to transcend their times. And I reply quite simply, politics and the lineages of power that, uh, that begot. And indeed, the examples, again, of Parsons is most instructive. In race, empire, and epistemic exclusion, or the structures of sociological thought, Julian Goh examines the history of why we read such thinkers in the first place to demonstrate the perspectivalism and partiality of that canon. Goh elucidates, and I will quote at length, why, for instance, is Weber in our canon? For a sociologist to answer by referring to Weber's inherent genius would insinuate a naive great man model of history or an essentialist theory of cultural objects that most sociologists alive um, to, social, to social determination would not otherwise countenance. Instead, we must recognize the inherent arbitrariness or social constructedness involved in canon formation. In 1927, the same year Du Bois was in New York for the fourth Pan-African Congress, Talcott Parsons approached Marion Weber about translating Weber's Protestant ethic into English. Parsons would later be one of the few men largely responsible for canonizing Weber in American sociology, yet his interest in Weber was very specific. At the time, Parsons was interested in theorizing social action, and he found Weber's writing on action especially useful. Parsons canonized Weber in no small part because of his own parochial interest in social action, and even more specifically because it later helped Parsons argue against both Skinner-esque behaviorism and neoclassical voluntarism. Weber's canonization came about because of the specific, particular local concern of this one guy, Talcott Parsons, and Parsons' own concern was particular and thus partial. Parsons thought in terms of the category social action and relatedly social order, rather than say capitalism, racialized violence, or the processual unfolding of gendered structures. Representing only one aspect of social life, even Parsons' grand theory was not exactly grand. As with the example of Parsons and Weber, it is essential to recognize that the sociological canon did not descend from the heavens as a perfect form. The canon and the authoritative place of its founders are rather a reconstructed narrative that demarcates lineages, a politically charged process of inclusion and exclusion. So is the danger truly that without these figures we would return to what Beauvoir warns would be a world before the canon, scattered in aimless empiricism, which would turn sociology into a minor branch of economics or political science? <laughs> 
or is that the or is that the discipline or is it that the discipline might rather pursue the path not taken? And I will repeat here one that adopts, according to Borovoy's description of a Du Boisian sociology, a global and historical perspective on capitalism that pays attention to the centrality of race, that pursues a moral, reflexive, and interdisciplinary science, and insists on public engagement. This is not a question of what is versus a sociology that might never have been, but what is versus what might have been. A might have been that is, again, a corrective to that which was negated by the politics, not the objective science of an earlier era. Borovoy concludes in his essay by stating, in these times when race, class, and gender have thrust themselves onto the political scene, when the survival of humankind is at stake, we desperately need Du Bois, not to dissipate, but to recompose sociology. But Michael, <laughs> race, class, and gender were always there on the political scene, front, center, and urgent as ever, albeit negated and silenced by the dominant strands of sociological thought. Hence, I return to Borovoy's observation that we are returning to the desperate times of raw capitalism, of deep economic and political crises. Who, I ask, is this we that is witnessing such a return? In the sociology of W.E.B. Du Bois, Itzigzon and Brown write that abstract universalism is in fact the standpoint of the dominant. And as Du Bois argues, the standpoint is characterized by carefully cultivated ignorance toward the humanity and life on the other side of the veil. In my forthcoming book, A Man Among Other Men, The Crisis of Black Masculinity and Racial Capitalism, I write that crisis is the permanent condition of blackness and racial capitalism. I call it a long crisis because the very incorporation of blackness entailed erasure of African and African descended people's histories and their very humanity. Putting the political economy of patriarchy and racial capitalism at the center of my analysis, among black men in particular, I argue that the experience of blackness's exclusion removed the entitlements anticipated for the laboring male subject according to the capitalist order of things. These crises of men and crises of work that have captured the popular imagination in recent years, justifying, for example, the ascent of Trump and his misogynist brand of white victimhood, is what Asho Mbembe has called the becoming black of the world. At the same time, the enduring exclusion from those core features of a supposedly every man's modernity, wage labor in an industrial or at least industrializing economy to provide for a nuclear family unit at home, not only rendered black men unruly subjects of modernity, surplus, but directed them towards strategies that prefigure the subject of the crisis economy that proposes alternative futures for all, and not always good. Du Bois argued that theorizing from the experience of the racialized subject provided a fuller account of modernity. Rather than returning to the raw capitalism that Borovoy describes, a Du Boisian sociology shows us that far from spasms of crisis, the modern capitalist world order has been a long crisis, a set of permanent fires that at times cross the color line and then become visible, but that always were and are as urgent as ever. Thank you. Thank you, Jordana. Uh, Frieden? Well, Jordana, I should have gone before you. Um, uh, it's a great pleasure to be able to share some remarks on Michael Burvoy's essay. I last visited Brown in May of 2019, the second convening of the Du Boisian Scholar Network, and I am deeply appreciative to all those who made that gathering and today's event possible. Oh, sorry. Is that better? Building on a long career of defending the possibility of a transformative and critical sociology, Michael Burvoy brings the discipline's foundational ideas and questions to bear on the many crises we, we see today. For Burvoy, the foundation must be rebuilt, but a foundation will remain. Instead of abandoning the canon altogether, Burvoy writes that, quote, out of the conversations between Marx, Weber, Durkheim, and Du Bois, there emerge new criteria that become foundational to our discipline. Importantly, Burevoy urges these conversations to be a two-way street. It's not simply that the canon has much to learn from Du Bois, but that a Du Boisian research program also stands to benefit from such meetings, as he describes them, between Du Bois and the familiar trio. Burevoy's recommendation here is likely to ruffle some feathers, and one that sets it apart from others who have called more explicitly for a rejection of the canon. 
My first question for Burrovoy is, what exactly makes this decolonial? Reconstituting the canon through a dialogue with Du Bois is no guarantee of a decolonial sociology. Indeed, Burrovoy leaves us to infer for ourselves because, curiously, the word decolonizing appears just a single time in the article. But the essay has forced me to reflect carefully about my own relationship with theory, Du Bois, and decolonization. For this, I'm grateful, and so I hope to have my own productive dialogue with the author. I suggest that one way of making sense of Burrovoy's most provocative statement concerning theory is to consider the unspoken meeting between theory and method in the essay between theory and the essay's seemingly innocuous idea of a dialogue, a method for achieving the essay's stated aim of reconstituting the canon, and whether and how that method is itself a praxis of decolonization. Now, who could dispute the need for more conversation? Du Bois meets Marx. Du Bois meets Durkheim. Du Bois meets Weber. It's what every faculty member wants, in fact, a calendar full of meetings. <laughs> <laughs> but all joking aside, my next questions for Burvoy are, how exactly does a conversation achieve the goals of decolonization? Who facilitates the exchange and serves as arbitrator when disagreements emerge? If the imposition of master languages is a fixture of the legacies of colonial violence, then who translates these dialogues for listeners? And how can these conversations transform ideas without subordinating decolonial thinkers to canonical theorists captured in labels such as the Marxist Du Bois? If, for Burrovoy, Du Bois can be used to reconstruct the canon, then I hope to reconstruct Burrovoy's own ideas with the larger aim of outlining a preliminary decolonial Du Boisian methodology. My use of methodology builds on Jose Itzikson's and Carita Brown's focus on Du Bois's self-reflective methodology linking the political and the personal. And following Alice Weinbaum, a Du Boisian methodology is, quote, counter-propaganda capable of offering forward new truths about the past that might alter futures yet to come." End quote. I want to suggest, contrary to the essay's explicit aims, that Burvoy and his past writings actually foretell a decolonial methodology that's more expansive, creative, and insurgent than a series of dialogues with canonical thinkers. A methodology I'm tentatively calling a Du Boisian shadow play urges us to consider three different dialogues. First, Du Bois' lifelong practice of careful scrutiny of his own past work illuminates the tradition of Du Bois meeting Du Bois. Much as how marginalized standpoints from outside the metropole are needed for decolonizing disciplines, insights from outside sociology are necessary for the building of a decolonial sociology. I draw inspiration from critical black studies, black geographies, and black literature in particular. Second. Michael Burrowboy's essay appears to be, to be an instance of this critical self-revision in the spirit of Du Bois. So an instance of my favorite meeting, Burrowboy meeting Burrowboy. <laughs> the essay underscores the author's commitment to the transformative power of reflexive science, reinforced across two of Burrowboy's major contributions, the methodological guide of the extended case method and his manifesto for public sociology. While the decolonization debates have shown how sociology suffers from historical amnesia, the corrective is not necessarily to highlight overlooked origin stories. Instead, the method I urge is a kind of genealogical investigation of researcher standpoints. Last, we have the dialogue between the author and the scholar denied, the instance of Burrovoy meeting Du Bois, where for Burrovoy, Du Bois evolves as an exemplar of public sociology to an architect for a decolonial sociology. I should say that I first imagined a dialogue between Burrovoy and Du Bois when I was completing my first book, and I bring some of those insights here in particular points of connection and tension between black politics and black feminism. Indeed, I want to encourage us most of all to think of a, dialogue in uh, of a dialogue in terms of radical connection and intimacy. First, Du Bois meets Du Bois. In 1904, Du Bois wrote a review of his own extraordinary book, The Souls of Black Folk, which was published the year before. Du Bois describes tantalizingly a penumbra of a vagueness sur surrounding his book. A statement that is instructive for two reasons, the first methodological and the second conceptual. For Du Bois, therefore, shadows are where method beats theory. First, Du Bois' self-review is a remarkable instance of a third consciousness where the author turns a microscope on his own expli explication of double consciousness. In Du Bois' famous words, black Americans live in the shadow of the racial veil, and shadows appear often in his writings. The penumbra refers to the outer edges of a shadow, where light is only partially obscured, unlike the umbra, the area of the shadow where no light enters. 
To think of this provocative phrase of Du Bois's in terms of the present conversation, the penumbra is the part at which darkness meets light. While the veil is often taken to be a metaphorical boundary for the color line, the shadow's penumbra offers a different way of thinking about dialogues and encounters, their depth, clarity, tones, and shades. Conceptually speaking, shadows are a deep metaphor that Du Bois would use to frame a conceptual system for global capitalism. In his 1924 essay, Worlds of Color, Du Bois explains how the riddle of Europe had cast colonial shadows across the globe. Du Bois's essay was bold and error-prone in equal measure. Du Bois even suggested that a French imperialism born out of more amicable race relations was preferable to the crass version of British imperialism. In what I've elsewhere referred to as a process of aftershadowing, Du Bois would often reflect on, revise, and recalibrate his ideas. Du Bois would later use Worlds of Color as the title of the third book of his trilogy, The Black Flame, completed in the final years of his life. A sprawling and even strange work of historical fiction, as well as quasi-autobiography, The Black Flame follows a protagonist by the name of Manuel Manzart. Through the 1930s, as part of a larger effort to nurture forms of Afro-Asian solidarity, Du Bois will elevate Japan as the champion of the darker world. Coinciding with Du Bois' own travel schedule at the time, in the book, the protagonist Manzart himself tours the world in 1936. Manzart will write home, quote, the Japanese clan might have led Asia and the world into a new era, but her headstrong leaders chose to apply Western imperialism to her domination of the East, and Western profit-making replaced Eastern idealism, end quote. The passage is a revision of Du Bois' own words from a 1937 newspaper column in which Du Bois had failed to see the absence of democratic freedom in Japan. According to Bill Mullen, with this act of textual rev revision, the older Du Bois punishes his younger self. Elsewhere in the book, Du Bois will again castigate and correct his earlier views of the French Empire. If traditional American literature has been defined by white authors playing out their racial fantasies in what Toni Morrison has called a playground of the imagination, then Du Bois turns to literature and journalism as vehicles of counter-propaganda. It is, to amend slightly uh, Morrison's own phrase, an example of Du Bois, quote, playing in the dark colonial shadows. In 1940, Du Bois will call himself the child of twilight, another penumbral location, here between the light of daytime and the darkness of nighttime, which for Du Bois is a space of creativity, rebellion, and even humility, where Du Bois urges constant self-reflection and revision in order to make sense of the riddle of empire. Next, Burrovoy meets Burrovoy. <laughs> Those familiar with Burrovoy's work will recognize that this brief article has the hallmarks of the author's intellectual and political commitments. The overriding theme is a belief in the transformative potential of sociology as a reflexive social science, one that Burrovoy writes, quote, places social scientists within the world they study as well as within their contested fields of inquiry, end quote. Two of Burrovoy's well-known contributions anchor this commitment to a reflexive social science. Thank you, Jordan. And the notion of dialogues has pride of place in both. First, there's Burrovoy's extended case method, a theoretically grounded methodology for undertaking ethnographic research. Du Bois is never mentioned in this methodological treatise, but the Du Boisian spirit animates the piece. Burrovoy's case study is post-colonial Zambia, and Du Bois will like, uh, likewise include Rhodesia in his famous statement in his essay, The Souls of Black Folk, of how the dark colonies built the world. A year before Zambia was made a British protectorate, in 1898, Du Bois endorsed his sociological interpretation, a program of observation and comparison that, quote, hones in on those finer manifestations of social life which history can but mention and which statistics cannot count, an early guide for the careful study of human populations that echoes later in the extended case method. In later advocating for a public sociology, Burrovoy will identify Du Bois as a guiding light. Defining a dialogue as mutual education, Burrovoy writes that, quote, public sociology brings sociology into conversation with publics, understood as people who are themselves involved in conversation. It's precisely this image of nested dialogues that I wish to foreground. While Burrovoy's present essay highlights conversations between leading thinkers, there are radical, feminist, and anti-colonial thinkers whose own previous and, and, and ongoing encounters with, with Du Bois are unacknowledged, but help facilitate the very conversations Burrovoy seeks to promote. Which brings us to our last dialogue, Burrovoy meets Du Bois. A sustained conversation between Du Bois and Burrovoy, I hope, would develop a decolonial method that embraces reflexivity, 
rigorous critique and self-critique, and creativity and disobedience. Burrovoy's engagement with Du Bois would seem an opportunity for Burrovoy to bring out of the shadows and more fully integrate a theory of feminism. In his manifesto for public sociology, Burrovoy writes that public sociology was born when, quote, the civil rights movement transformed sociologists' understanding of politics, and it was the feminist movement that gave new direction to so many spheres of sociology. By giving pride of place to the problem of the color line, Burrovoy makes a similar move as Du Bois, who wrote that, quote, the uplift of women is next to the problem of the color line and the peace movement, our greatest modern cause. Feminist scholars have noted Du Bois's tendency here to juxtapose feminism with anti-racism without ever sufficiently integrating the two. Yet women and feminism supported his own anti-colonial struggles. In fact, it was black women who fought to acknowledge Du Bois's anti-colonial and radical efforts precisely when he had become the scholar exiled that Burrovoy speaks of. In her 1971 biography of her husband, Shirley Graham Du Bois, an important activist and intellectual in her own right who helped guide Du Bois's turn to the left, chronicles Du Bois's fight against imperialism. This history was a necessary corrective to the first biographies of Du Bois, examples of Cold War propaganda that dismissed Du Bois' internationalist politics. A critical black feminism casts light on the penumbral locations where the political meets the personal. It thinks beyond the familiar portrayal of the public-facing, globe-trotting Du Bois to the more dimly lit legacies of empire, or what Hazel Carby has called imperial intimacies. What might it mean, for example, that Du Bois found himself, Durkheim found himself at a loss to apply his own theories on war and morality following his death, the death of his son, a soldier who died in World War I defending the very French empire that Du Bois would come to critique. These are not simply intellectuals or advocates or activists who dialogue with one another, but two fathers whose own knowledge production was profoundly shaped by the death of their own children. Du Bois' son, Burghardt, succumbed in 1899 to diphtheria, a disease that was a scourge of colonialism. And Du Bois would turn to literature to sustain dialogues, at times troubling, perplexing, critical, and insightful with women. To return to the Black Flame trilogy a final time, the trilogy's most extraordinary character is Jean Dubignon, a woman and sociologist who is a composite of Du Bois, his second wife, a female character he had authored in the pages of the Crisis magazine, as well as one of Du Bois' lovers in the early 1900s. Some scholars have pointed to the erotic dimensions of this association. With this character, we shift, for instance, from considering the scholar denied to ask what the scholar had desired. I don't reject this interpretation, but place it rather in productive tension with another view of Du Bois in drag, as Lauren Anderson has called him. Dubignon has also shared Du Bois' own anti-colonial freedom dreams, as she reads C.L.R. James's classic, The Black Jacobins, and travels to the West Indies to learn more about uh, French and British occupation in that region. In his last major work, Du Bois places black women at the vanguard of anti-colonial struggle, and he reconstructs his own decades-long ideas on the place of women in black intellectual history and politics. In summary, Michael Burrovoy was a guest speaker in a course I took my first year of graduate school in 2005. He mentioned something that stuck with me. Theory is a map. Like maps, theory offers guidance when you seek direction. But maps have also been the stuff of imperialist fantasies and their attendant desires for discovery and progress. Efforts to decolonize sociology must think carefully about its methods and maps. How do you draw a map following Toni Morrison without, quote, the mandate for conquest? This imperial dialect recalls the ghost in the machine of canonical American literature, as Morrison describes it once more, and we ought to be aware of the ghosts that haunt sociology's own vocabulary as we reimagine new ways of speaking with one another. My hope is that as we use Du Bois to engage the sociological canon, or whoever else, we bring to that conversation the transcripts of conversations other fields have already had with Du Bois. Reconstructing a discipline's foundations need not lead to further disciplinary provincialism. As Burvoy reminds us, the whole debate about uh, Du Bois and the classics matters if whatever dialogues and emerge can help us navigate today's many crises. I imagine Burrovoy is speculating about the possibility of such dialogues to produce coalitions, as he's discussed in his writings on public sociology. This new grammar should do more than nurture political mo mobilization. 
Following Cedric de Leon, who spoke at the convening of the Du Boisian Scholar Network two years ago, this politics must also embrace an ethic of care, or a feminist erotic politics for new worlds we desire and make for one another in the worlds of Tiffany Lothado King. Near the end of his life, Du Bois and his wife, Shirley Graham, traveled, as had the fictional Jean Dubignon, to the West Indies. Du Bois had drawn family trees to map, as it were, his own imperial intimacies, and discovered he was the descendant of a slave owner who had taken a slave as his common-law wife. Du Bois is disappointed to find no existing records of his ancestors during the visit to the Bahamas. Instead, he finds people living modestly but joyfully, who call Du Bois a proud name, and are happy that a Du Bois as the people there pronounced it, had returned home. Whether it reforms the canon or rejects it, a decolonial sociology should seek out new forms of connection in our deeply alienating times and embrace a politics of love. Thank you. So thank you, uh, Michael, for starting the conversation. And thank you, Jordan and Frieden, for those truly extraordinary uh, remarks and commentaries. Um, we have till 10.45, right, Jose? Yeah, so. Yes, yeah, I checked the schedule. So unless you've made any changes, we have a good full half hour for uh, a public conversation. But I think we're going we're gonna to give Michael just a, a few minutes to quickly respond before we open it up. I, it's Pretty impossible to respond. <laughs> um, those are two extraordinarily moving commentaries. I mean, it was worth writing that essay just to hear your two commentaries. <laughs> um, and, and it's true that, as Frieden said, I mean, I do love sociology. Evelyn Nakano Glenn wrote a paper once, oh, the boy who loves sociology. Um, so yes, and, and I'm of a generation. I mean, I always found sociology uh, uh, appealing. But, but I think there's, there's two ways to go. And one is to keep, to reconstruct or to actually constitute a sort of black radical tradition within sociology. And I may, if there is a dialogue that I'm suggesting, then it may indeed explode sociology. Um, and actually I had, what was actually, I, is it still working? No. No, all right. Oh, no, I'm just one second. This is my last comment. That was my cannon. <laughs> is this it, Michael? Hmm? No, that's okay. And then, there's, that's right, the very last one. That's what might happen. Um, there will be it. So, yes, yeah, so I, I think that's what... The, this is a generational issue, and I'm just delighted that there is this, there is this insurgency within sociology, and beautifully expressed by both of you. Um, and... And I believe still that it is important. Gramsci says this, you know, he was always insistent that one should take the dominant ideas very seriously and engage with them, as well as engage with the ideas of the dominated. And I think we still have to wrestle with the dominant, and sociology contains the dominant ideology. And so that wrestling is really, I believe, important. I'll end there. Great. Thank you, Michael. So uh, the floor is open. Yeah, uh, I was a little concerned with the assumptions underlying the two critical responses. And I don't think that they were honest in naming the philosophical foundations of their critiques. Uh, it does not, if we take those critiques, it won't take us out of the Western canon. If I am reading the style of critique correctly, it's the, it's, it's the style of critique that has grown out of post-structuralism, which constructs society on the model of a modernist text. The metaphors, right, the origin stories, all of that, right? <clears throat> is what we've gained from post-structuralism. Right? I have nothing against post-structuralism. <laughs> uh, nothing against Foucault and Derrida. Right? <clears throat> they, the international fame that they achieved, they absolutely deserve it. But <clears throat> they continue the Western canon. They have replaced 
right? Marx, Weber, Durkheim, <clears throat> in the Western imagination. Okay. If we're decolonizing sociology, right? <clears throat> and we use post-structuralist critiques to decenter, uh, displace uh, the canon, and we construct it on the basis of a model of society as the text. Why is this not continuing our embeddedment in the Western path? And I don't see how that will necessarily get us to a post-colonial sociology. Second, the thing that remains unspoken here is we are in the classic Western competition for the center. I'm centering black feminism. I'm centering the boys. I'm centering race. And I'm decentering X, Y, and Z. This is the history of the Western metaphysical tradition. The question of the center, why am I centering so and so? Take post structuralism again. What did they do? They displaced economic determinism, in particular a Marx, centering the economic, and replaced it with the centering of the semiotics of language. That's the post structuralist revolution. And if we're going to be serious about breaking with Western dominance, we are going to have to go to that depth, right? And I'm not so sure that uh, the idea, unless we have a different approach to the centering of a discourse, a discipline, right? I really think that a conversation, a profound conversation about why are we centering the boys? Why are we centering race? Until we do that, I'm not so sure that we are breaking out of this tradition of the Western intellectual tradition. So, hold the mic Would Would anyone like to respond? I happily, mm -hmm. sure. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, we're meeting a paper where it's at, right? The paper is about the canon, so we're having a conversation about the canon, right? So to start with, I mean, when I was actually a, a discussant for Jose and Carita's uh, book at ASA this summer, and one of the things I said was, why, why are we so fixated on a discipline? I'm all for interdisciplinarity. I'm actually not fixated on the discipline. But if we are, we're talking about a canon, which is talking about a center. That's precisely what talking about a canon is, right? And if we're talking about origin stories, if we're talking about founding fathers, we're talking about origin stories. So this is an engagement with something that's been written, but it's not necessarily saying this is what the, the solution should be. So as far as, you know, I, and when I started my comments, I said I'm engaging specifically the theory of history and the conception of sociology. And so one of the reasons I said that is because, you know, as far as the moral science and the methodology um, that, that Michael was pointing to, I don't actually have that much to say about that. But I do have, and this is coming not, I wouldn't say, I mean, and I'm a big fan of Foucault, but I'm much more of a post-colonial theorist than I am a post-structuralist, is understanding that these stories, again, being told by the canonical thinkers, were fundamentally flawed. They were just wrong. And if we want to have a theory of history that I believe is a better theory of history, then we have to, then what we're engaging is actually a question of political economy, not a moral science. And so I would not even say that after, you know, as I'm developing as a scholar, I would say I am more of a political economy scholar than I am a sociologist per se. And if we're talking about political economy, then racial capitalism is my theory of history. And because when I look at history, that's what, to me, tells the best story of how we are in what our modern world capitalist system looks like. 
is through understanding the co-constitution, and that's how I define, a la Cedric Robinson, the history of modernity, is the co-constitution of capitalism and race. That is what I think is actually the all-encompassing, it makes the most sense. And so, you know, and, and as far as the centering and decentering goes, I remember when I was, I was writing my, my ASR paper and um, racial capitalism and the crisis of black masculinity and I was getting wonderful feedback um, from, from a scholar and I was talking about theorizing race and gender. And the scholar said, wait a minute, you're not theorizing race and gender, you're theorizing blackness and masculinity. And that was absolutely correct. I'm not trying to tell a grand story when I write about um, you know, race and gender. I'm trying to still tell a story about blackness and masculinity. And so I don't think that's actually a centering, right? That's understanding a positionality and that explains a lot of, of orientations, but it's not saying that we tell history better. And this is actually one of my comments, uh, the other comment that I had my critique with, with Creed and Jose was that are we talking about, um, so, so when they, what they were talking about in, in, in the sociology of W.E. Du Bois is that the standpoint theory, right, the standpoint from the, the dispossessed and understanding subjectivity. And I fear that in sociology, sometimes there becomes this fixation on subjectivity and then you're, you're getting ethnographers that are trying to slum it that are trying to, I want to know what it's like to be black, and then I'm going to tell good sociology. And what I think it actually is, is about power, trying to understand relations of power. And that certainly can be from understanding corporate America, multinational corporations, understanding marginalized populations. But so, so I would actually contend that I do think it's actually flawed to say then if we're centering that the, the story of black feminism is actually, it, it illuminates things, right? It, like I said in, in my remarks, it illuminates this, the, the position from the other side of the color line illuminates the fact that we're always in crisis. But I wouldn't say that we can only tell the story from that. I don't think that that's correct. Um, and, and yeah, I mean, as far as like the obsession with semiotics, I mean, one of the, the conversations in academia that annoys me the most because I, I embrace post, both positions is the, the Marxists who attack post-colonial theorists and say that, you know, they're only interested in culture or they're only interested in, in literature or art or whatever and they, you know, point out um, Orientalism and Said and that's absolutely not correct. It's understanding the relationship between culture and political economy, that they work together. So I don't think it's an either or and I think that those conversations are also often very flawed. Um, and and the, the critiques are, are missing what post-colonial theory is adding to understandings of, for example, racial capitalism or political economy. Thank you. Uh, yeah, please, Frida. Um, yeah, um, Professor Henry, thank, thanks for the, um, uh, the comments here. And I, th I think I can offer two, two quick thoughts uh, to follow up to Jordana. Um, I think first, you know, the, the sort of indictment from, from any number of folks that, um, you know, uh, the sort of humanist tradition I'm drawing on can be subsumed under post-structuralism, I think is precisely the very critique that the, the authors I'm, I'm citing are, are wishing to be critical of. Um, I think in a way, sort of subsuming, you know, some of this work under this framework of post-structuralism itself is a, is a masculinist sort of endeavor. Um, and then the second thing I'll say here is sort of concerning the center and, and decentering. Um, I think I will say, you know, call it whatever you wish, the center, the middle, uh, you know, I think the sort of struggle for placing the, the kind of radical forms of intimacy and connection that I hope to place at the center, or again, whatever you wish to call it, is, is worth sort of struggling for. Um, and I think it's sort of the struggle for language. And I think I, I hear, um, I, I can understand, I believe where you're coming from. Um, but it's a very sort of kind of uh, dualistic thinking between a sort of a center and, and a decentering that, uh, that Du Bois himself would be, you know, deeply critical of. Um, I think sort of in his own work, trying to draw out kind of ambivalent antagonisms between the center and the, the, uh, the margins, the periphery and the metropole, whatever you wish to call it. I think Du Bois had a much more kind of sophisticated take of the um, this located in, in what I'm uh, sort of calling this penumbral sort of location. Um, and it's really drawing at the depth of that encounter in the middle between these two um, sort of uh, sides on the binary is, you know, that's the space I, I think I, I wish to sort of uh, sit in and sort of consider and reflect 
reflect on. But. Mm. So, okay. Uh, good. Very good. Now All right. So, in the interest of time and and to to to, to maximize the dialogue, I I'd, I'd like to propose we take a few questions and then uh, save maybe five six minutes at the very end to have the the panelists respond. So, if you have questions, please raise your hand. And N Nabila. Uh, thank you so much for this amazing conversation. I want to go back to uh, Professor Matlin's question. You know, who is this we? And, and I want to ask, again, like, who is the we? Not just, you know, and her answer is kind of, there has never been a we. And, and, and then, is the we the sociologist? Is a we something that is already preformed as sociologists? Um, as we all maybe know that not all sociologists feel similarly about other people being sociologists. Um, or is the we, you know, uh, an invocation meant to, is it a gesture towards solidarity? And is it, a, is it an invitation? Um, and can we, and when you do that, the, the what Professor Madeline said always happens is that, why should I be in solidarity with you when we've never been part of this we before? Um, so how to go forward from there? Tony, do you have your hand up? Yeah, it's a little bit of a random question, which, which Michael may appreciate from an earlier conversation. We shared a mentor who was a, a guy uh, that disappeared and many years ago. I've not been associated with, with, with these discussions for a very, very long time, but uh, I had the privilege of participating in a, in a seminar with him where we spent weeks discussing Hegel's master and slave. Uh, essay. And when I listen to the, the discussion on post-colonialism, I mean, the fundamental take-home of that canonical text for me was the co-constitution of the dominant and the dominated. And, you know, it seems like each field forward uh, is expanding the discussion of what that co-constitution means. Um, and I'm just wondering, First, as an empirical matter, did, who I don't know, did Du Bois ever engage with that text explicitly? And second, isn't what we're talking about the co-constitution of the dominated and the dominant? Thank you, Tony. Questions? Questions? Ricky? Um, yeah, first of all, thank you so much for, for this conversation. It's a real joy listening to you all. Um, I just I have a question about the sociology of knowledge, just going back to Michael's proposition. Um, it's a two-part question. So first, um, to, uh, it's a question about social context. So to build a conversation between those canonical thinkers it's easy to assume that they're talking as equals, right? And this is, as we know, empirically flawed. Du Bois is a scholar denied, but he's also speaking in the context of a colonial episteme where, you know, European knowledge is universal, non-European knowledge is partial, and he's writing to a world that is unwilling to listen. So how do you, how do you account for these power relationships if you're trying to reconstruct a dialogue between these founders. And then the second part is, I just wanted to hone in on kind of the um, distinction between Jose and Carita, Jordana, and then, um, and then Michael's intervention, which is about epistemic privilege. Um, do these thinkers offer different but equal windows into a world, or does Du Bois offer an epistemically privileged perspective. Um, and in my reading of Du Bois, he actually makes that case through his theory of second sight, that if you're, if you're seeing from underneath the veil, you see something about the white world, the white world can't see itself, and we see that all the time, right? And like feminist thought, the insider-outsider, and C.L.R. James, you know, in but not off Euro Europe, in Stuart Hall, etc. So. Does, give, does Du Bois give us epistemic privilege? And if so, is he on par with Marx, Weber, 
Jose. Yeah, thank for this great panel. Uh, I mean, it was really, really enjoyable listening to all of you. I, I was looking at that canon, I wanted to <laughs> <laughs> ask Michael, I mean, uh, how do you ambition uh, that, I mean, wh wh what, is that, what is meant to show? Because, you know, I think that generationally I'm closer to you than to Jordan, and I value sociology. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and Thank you! <laughs> <laughs> but in part I value sociology, and I tell this story always to my first year student in classical sociology, because I think sociology is the closest thing to Marx's idea of the end of the division of labor because you can be an ethnographer in the morning and <laughs> 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 the theory at evening. So, I mean, sociology for me is a quintessential interdisciplinary, uh, um, you know, uh, discipline. And when we wrote the book with Carida, whether are we reconstructing or revolutionary, I mean, what, what we wanted to do is to, to push the boundaries, I mean, to, to make sociology broader, I mean, uh, but I, I see the canon and I think, you know, uh, you think that doing that leads to civil war in sociology, what, I mean, what what is that, uh, you know, signaling, I mean, what, I mean, do we need to respect certain boundaries or, I mean, just, uh, if you can elaborate on that image, because, you know, I'm, I'm thinking, okay, what does, you know, <laughs> what, does it, what is it telling? And, you know, just to say one more thing, I think that, you know, for all the tensions here, this is a dialogue between people that are in the same camp, ultimately. <laughs> <laughs> I mean. <laughs> Well, it's always a pleasure, Michael. It's nice to see you again. Nice and to see you again. We always see each other in masks, so distance, right? <laughs> That's right. And thank you, Jordana and Frida. I really enjoyed your papers and your responses. I, I, I don't want to get too esoteric here, but I wonder if we could contest some of the concepts, the theoretical concepts that are being utilized. And I perhaps just listening to uh, Professor Henry, um, I'm, I'm the metaphor of decolonization. I know there's post-colonial theory, but I wonder, I, you know, I've been jumping back into some of the old, some of some older um, theory, and um, I guess it goes back to Parsons, but I, you know, I'm contending with this idea because it seems to be implicit, Michael, in your article, that there is a primordial core in some ways. And here we are, People use it, utilizing the terms decolonization or uh, the, the canon, decentering versus incentering. And what we're talking about is status differentiation and the idea that there's the coexistence of multiple realities in society that were not ever really realized or, 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 or accepted or acknowledged in the construction of theories of society. And so, if you have, and this is the political, if you have a primordial core that cons, cons, there's a group that's constructed as the core, primordially of a discipline, and that is actually, the, and it is contestable and it's political, and it is also in many ways erasing what's already happening. Um, I, I guess the question for me is not so much about uh, whether or not we want to get back to the dominated, including the, dom the, the marginalized or the least dominant or the enslaved or whatever terms we use. Because I'm trying to understand why is it that we never really fully realize or, or we're having a problem with status differentiation, with social differentiation, period, at the core of our organizations, our institutions, our society. Um, because when we push back in the way that you're talking about, about maintaining the core, there is a protectionism that's going on around some idea of primordiality. And so I'd be curious if you, you, because that's what I'm hearing, that there, even in American society, the early republic had a pri primordial core. When there were people already here, which is what post-colonial, that's, that's what many are trying to talk to us. There were existence, there were realities. History is trying to get us to understand that, which was often ignored. And so how do you, how do you wrestle with that? Um, that in a particular historical moment that erasure occurred, a core was constituted, it was socially constructed by 
white males, many of whom were European, uh, uh, of European heritage. And now we're in a political and cultural and historical moment where people say, hey, that wasn't right. If you want to maintain this discipline, if we actually want to be socially progressive, we have to contend with what that core was, and it was socially constructed. And it was polit it is politically contestable. So how do you reproduce that in this moment when others are saying, see what was wrong at the moment in which it was created? That's the question. <laughs> <laughs> Terrific. Uh, we have all of seven minutes uh, <laughs> to engage with this extraordinary set of questions. So may maybe we'll start with Jordana and then Frida sure. and then Michael. I think I can be really quick. I mean, there's there's a lot of uh, really rich remarks and, and comments, but if, if I could sum up, you know, um, kind of an approach that, that responds to all of them in some way, um, one is is what we study, and then one is you know the discipline is like the politics of the discipline itself. And the first point is that you know I would certainly advocate, and this is kind of continuing from my last remark, that what and and, and this is what I talked about in, on that panel, but that we replace our study of objects with relations. Right? I think that we would do much better to look at relationalities, those power dynamics, all of that, and that be our object of study instead of people or places or things. And I think that is actually much more illuminating. Um, and and I, I, I have that in, in my, the introduction I, of my book as well. And then the, what you're saying, um, prudence is it's we've got a path dependency and that's a very pragmatic political issue right and so certainly you know I had a dialogue with Jose in a series of emails after the panel and my positionality I'm younger I don't have the stakes of having students who I'm trying to get jobs I'm in an interdisciplinary department so I'm free to say I'm an interdisciplinary who looks at political economy and not a sociologist because that does not determine my tenure status right <laughs> and so who I am is is reflecting what I have the freedom to say and, and articulate and resources, you know, and, and, the, and the founding of the disciplines, all of the disciplines, right? I mean, I, I joke that I'm, I'm a, you know, a consequence of colonialism, that most of the people that, that or, or a victim, that most of the people I cite are actually anthropologists because I study Africa and that was the study of peoples, not societies, right? And so we have sociology and anthropology and I don't really see a difference between the two. Um, but but it's a colonial difference, right? So the way the disciplines were founded, as you said, that they were problematic, but now there are foundations, there are resources, there's how do you make your le yourself legible if you want to publish in a top journal if you're not citing the right people, right? So if you're citing outside of your discipline, I don't have an answer for that. That's just the reality of the situation and, and, and navigating it, um, but, but it is the reality, right? Seven minutes, he said. <laughs> um, I, I think I could, I'd, I'd like to respond to the question actually here from the middle, which I appreciated about um, whether um, you know, Hegel's own thinking about co-constitution was taken up by Du Bois. And I think that question itself is precisely the kind of sort of methodological intervention I'm hoping for us to reflect on, which is, it's true, you know, I think plenty have, have, have uh, considered uh, the influence of Hegel's thinking on Du Bois. Shimun's Amir comes to mind, for example. But I think the, the issue now we need to take up is whether we can have that conversation without, you know, calling this Du Bois the Hegelian Du Bois, right? And so, <laughs> and, you know, Weber corresponded with, with Du Bois, but no one will ever call him, as Lewis Gordon said it best, uh, the Du Boisian Weber, right? Um, and I think it's an issue in terms of methodology because, you know, we can't have, as I'm sort of contending here, an issue about reconstituting the canon or whatever concerning theory without, a, a very hard conversation about the method that, that we need to use in order to facilitate that conversation. And so, for example, when I ask my own students to place Du Bois in, in conversation with any number of other thinkers, it's not that simple. We need to talk about you know, how a third party, for example, might need to intervene to, to help sort of translate disagreements on both sides. And I think here, again, Du Bois has a way of sort of thinking about this. I think he, uh, his uh, sort of thinking concerning pragmatism uh, Paul Taylor has a wonderful piece sort of showing that Du Bois always sought sort of a third path out of two competing ideas, uh, which he calls meliorism. And so really sort of thinking hard about how you need a methodological sort of intervention to make sense of sort of conceptual disagreements. Um, but, you know, I want to be able to do that without having to call Du Bois the Hegelian Du Bois, right? So. Thank you. 
Michael, you have two minutes. Good luck. Thanks. <laughs> um, all right. Um, um, yeah, I, I, I'm clear about this, this idea of a primordial core. It just goes against the grain of what I, how I think about it. There's, there's, the idea is that this so-called core is continually being reconstructed. Now, definitely, definitely under specific political, socio-economic conditions, but it is being continued, and that's why I think we're in a very interesting moment where there is a emergent, different set of criteria for what actually does join, yes, I dare say it, this, this discipline of sociology. So I, I, I think that it's not, there isn't something, it's, it's a continually changing core, if you will. And, well, there may not be agreement um, so the, 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 the canon, Jose, is to suggest if we bring, if we seriously take Du Bois into sociology and try and have these conversations, and I totally agree with you, Frieden, that these conversations are not at all easy. I just, you know, blasé passing through it, but they're, they're, they're very difficult because they're speaking in different registers. I mean, but if we do, it seems that sociology may explode. It may get reconstructed, it may explode. I mean, Durkheim may drop out. Marshall and Pareto dropped out, so why shouldn't Durkheim drop out? But let us have these conversations and see what happens rather than be dismissive. I think that we would strengthen Du Bois at the same time as strengthening sociology. Now, when, if I may just say that, in, you know, in the 70s, when we were building Marxism collectively, and a young generation, like the young generation next to me on my left, and I don't know where Patrick is, um, um, it, it, with the, with the, we, we worked on two feet. One was, we better maintain our place in sociology because we were in sociology, and we had to survive in sociology, and we barely survived, I barely survived, on the one hand, but on the other hand, we had another audience, an audience of specifically Marxists. We were writing in Marxist journals. Uh, Eric Wright always, we both of us, always were wanting to have both feet. And, and I think that we... ...disciplinary and build a black radical tradition at the same time as we continue to have a conversation with those who are left, will be the majority for now, in the discipline. And, I think that's that's the way to go forward. Um, all right, that's enough. Okay. Please join me in thanking Michael Jordan. <laughs>